A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium arrived and won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he got up and entered the city. On the following day, he left with Barnabas for Derbe. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and made a considerable number of disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. They strengthened the spirits of the disciples and exhorted them to persevere in the faith, saying, It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They appointed presbyters for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their faith. Then they traveled through Pisidia and reached Pamphylia. After proclaiming the word at Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now accomplished. And when they arrived, they called the church together and reported what God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Then they spent no little time with the disciples. <laughs> Your friends make known, O Lord, the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Let all your works give you thanks, O Lord, and let your faithful ones bless you. Let them discourse of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. Making known to men your might in the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom for all ages, and your dominion endures through all generations. May my mouth speak the praise of the Lord, and may all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Dominus vobiscum. Et corus pieretur tuo. Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Ioannem. Gloria tibi et homine. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. You heard me tell you, I'm going away and I will come back to you. 
If you love me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will no longer speak much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father, and that I do just as the Father has commanded me. Verbum Domini. This section of John chapter 14, beginning with verses 27 to 31, is the conclusion of this chapter. And one of the important things to pay attention to is the way that it makes reference back to the beginning of the chapter in the first few verses of the same chapter. And this is a very common way for somebody to, especially in the ancient world, to show that something is meant as a unity. It's a whole one piece to show that you mention something at the beginning and then repeat it at the end, and that's meant to interpret everything in between. So that's part of the style. And some of the language here comes right from the very beginning. Do not let your hearts be troubled, is exactly how John 14, verse 1 begins and uses the same word, me tarasasto, that this sense of not being troubled. Now, one of the reasons that he is going to say, let not your hearts be troubled, is because their hearts were troubled. He had also said at the beginning of John 14 that I am going away and I will come back to you. Now, he, he talked there about how he was going away to prepare a dwelling for them. And then he would bring them to that dwelling because in my father's house are many dwellings. And so he promised that he was going to go away in order to come back for them. So again, he's tying that together with this section here. And he's showing that, um, you know, there's going to be another point about it. It's not only that he's going away in order to prepare a dwelling for them, as in John 14, 1 through 5, but here he is calling for them to make a response to his going away. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father. Now, this is something that is understandably difficult. So many people, as a matter of fact, that the older we live, the more commonly this is going to be the case. We lose people that we love to death. And the longer we live, the more people we know die. That's part of living longer. The only way to avoid that is to have a very short life. And this is something that uh, is difficult for any of us because we don't like to lose the people we love to death. But that experience would also be the apostles. Christ will make mention again in chapter 16 of how this is troubling for them, that he has to go away. And he's reminding them that his going away is part of God's plan. 
in that this is not only God's plan for the life of Jesus, but it's also his plan for us. Because again, he goes away in order to prepare salvation for us. And that's a very important element of this. But then, one of the reasons that he gives for us to rejoice that he's going back to the Father is a verse that becomes somewhat difficult for many people over the centuries. One of the reasons our Lord gives is for the Father is greater than I. Now this has caused a number of people who have a superficial understanding of Christ to have certain heresies come up about Jesus. There was a priest from Egypt named Arius. Actually, he was from Libya. His name was Arius. And he took this verse and then concluded that the reason the Father is greater than Jesus is that Jesus is a creature and the Father created him. And he used this verse to nullify other verses where Jesus our Lord says, the Father and I are one. For instance, in John chapter 10, verse 30. Or I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. In John 10, 38, and also here in chapter 14. And he said that this undoes those verses, and that they don't matter. And what we are called to do, this is key to Catholic understanding of Scripture, is that we don't have the verse nullify other things written in Scripture, but we understand it in its context of the, its background and in the other texts. One of the things that's very important to understand in terms of a Jewish background to this text is seen in a Jewish writing known as the Midrash Rabbah. It's a commentary on the first five books of the Bible. And in the Midrash Rabbah, on Genesis 32, it says that the one who sends someone is greater than the one who is sent. And by saying that the Father is greater, he's using that Jewish principle and helping to explain something that he has said over and over again. As a matter of fact, in every chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus our Lord mentions that the Father sent him. He came not to do his will, but the will of his heavenly Father. He doesn't say his words, but the words given to him by his heavenly Father. Over and over again, he emphasizes that he is on a mission from the Father. And this phrase brings out the Jewish understanding that the one who sends someone on a mission is greater than the one sent and is highlighting this sense of being on the mission. That's one sense. Then we go into the Gospel of John, and we see all the things that Christ says right here in this Last Supper discourse. Remember, this discourse is the longest single section of the New Testament. It goes from chapter 13 through 17. And 
in that context in John 17, verse 4 and 5, Jesus our Lord says that I have glorified your name, Father. Now give me the glory that I once had with you. And later on in John 17, it's the glory that I had from before the foundation of the world. This sense in John 17, at the beginning and end of that chapter, is that Christ, in his human mission, in his mission after he became flesh, is someone who no longer has the same glory that he once had in heaven. But he also has absolute confidence in John 17 that once he ascends into heaven, that same glory that he had from before the foundation of the world is going to be restored to him. But during the earthly ministry, Christ does not have that glory. You see a little bit of that in the other Gospels, when at the moment of the transfiguration, you see for a relative instant that the glory is returned to Jesus and that he has that moment of glory on the mountain where even his clothes shine like lightning. But it fades. And it just shows what he did have as he meets with the Father on the mountain and the Father speaks to him, but doesn't have through the ministry. Also, when you take a look at Paul's teaching. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, you see that he brings out the same point, that Jesus did not hold on to his divinity, but he emptied himself. And in that emptying himself of the glory of heaven, he became a human and took the form of a slave, even to the point of dying on the cross. And that that process of his emptying himself is exactly what is being referred to here. At this point, during the public ministry, Christ has emptied himself of the glory that he had, and he lives as one of us in order to redeem us and lift us up to that glory because that's one of the other things that he promises in John 17, that he would bring those who believe in him to the glory, they would see the glory that he had from the foundation of the world and he will bring them into that glory. So that's why he emptied himself. But that's also why he can speak at this moment of the Father being greater than he because of that emptying. Saint Cyril of Alexandria and Saint Augustine and other fathers of the church emphasize this aspect. And they see that this is, you know, a a, key to understanding that Christ has emptied himself for our sake, but he will be returned to that glory in the ascension into heaven. Now, having said this, he reminds them, I told you this before it happens, so that when it happens you may believe. You may believe they are going to see Christ emptied even further. It's not only that he's emptied of the glory of the Father in the public ministry, 
but that emptying will be complete to the point of suffering and dying on the cross. And he is letting them know this is what's going to happen so that you know I said it would happen and I want you to have faith through that process of my dying on the cross. And then he moves into another element that is related to this issue. When he said, I no longer speak much with you for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me, but the world must know that I love the Father and that I do just as the Father has commanded me. That this sense of the coming of the ruler of the world is already alluded to back in chapter 13. I think it's verse 27. When Satan enters into Judas, and Judas goes out to bring the high priests. And that this use of Judas Iscariot to betray Christ is seen in the context of this battle that Christ has engaged in, a battle against the prince of this world, Satan, who he also describes as the father of lies and a murderer. And even though the ruler of the world is coming and there's still, there's an element in which he has already come into Judas, but it's going to be in chapter 18 when Judas brings the soldiers and the crowd to arrest Jesus, that the battle is engaged and that Christ is fighting against the ruler of this world. And he will be understand that the trials that he undergoes at the house of the priests and with Pilate are going to be struggles against the ruler of this world the leaders of this world get used by the evil one to oppose Christ and to bring about this total emptying in the cross. But while it looks to them as if they have the upper hand, in reality, Jesus brings out the point that he has no power over me. The ruler of this world does not control Jesus. He does not have power. And well, look to those who are the instruments of the ruler of this world as if they are in charge. Especially pay attention to chapter 18 and 19 as Jesus has the, the dialogues with Pilate. And Pilate simply understands this as a struggle of this world. And Jesus even tells him, I could bring on legions of angels, but that is not what I came to do. And ultimately, no matter how powerful the forces of this world look, they have no power over Jesus. It's rather through all this, the world itself to whom Jesus was sent. Remember John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that those who believe in him might have eternal life. And it is while Jesus is engaged in the struggle against the world and the ruler of this world that the world will see the real truth, a truth Pilate could not grasp because he was so cynical as a member of the world that he could only say, well, what is truth? In his cynicism, he couldn't understand the truth. But disciples who have faith can see 
that the world must know that I love the Father and that I do as the Father has commanded and that all of this empty will be part of that obedience to the Father, the mission he has been given and doing the Father's will.